In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father the Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then <clears throat> did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house, quoting the scriptures. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Once more, we begin with the literal sense. Remember that Jesus spent 30 years of what is known as his hidden life in Nazareth. Although he was born in Bethlehem because of the census, and they spent a few years in Egypt before finally going back to Palestine, and instead of settling in Bethlehem, where he had been born, where he had begun his life, uh, they had gone to Nazareth. In the safety of that settlement, from where, in the first place, Mary and Joseph had also been born and had grown. They were immigrants from Bethlehem in the southern hill country of Judea to the northern region of Galilee, virgin country, lush, mountainous even around the volcano. And they had lived there in a place which these days we would, would be equivalent to Mendes, Alfonso, um, off the ridge of Tagaytay because that's the formation of Galilee, like around Tagaytay or around Taal Lake. In any case, at a given moment when he was about 30, he begins his public life by going to the hill country or rather going to Judea, being baptized there by John in the Jordan, spending maybe a few months and finally, he returns, but instead of settling in Nazareth, he settles in Capernaum, where there's more foot traffic, it's closer to the lake, for what he was going to do, which was to evangelize, it was a better deal rather than staying there in the boondocks of Nazareth. But of course, Nazareth was his hometown. His relatives were there. And it's expected that he would try to evangelize there as well. And so he did. And this is the scene that we're witnessing. And several things come up in that scene. First was the incredulity of his townspeople regarding his messianism, his capacity to teach, especially since he was teaching such a, a sublime doctrine, a very clear shall we say, departure from the usual way that the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching the Old Testament, the prophets and the law. Not to change them per se, but to bring them back to their original fidelity. And they found that difficult to accept. As I told you, the greatest, shall we say, hindrance to the spread of the gospel among the chosen people was the, the comfort zone that they had settled into in the way they were observing the law and the prophets. They were the recipients of such a rich tradition. They were the chosen race. 
It was to them that God was revealing himself in a much clearer way, not just perea que facta sunt, as St. Paul would say, by those things that had been made with the natural light of reason. Because the existence of God, the natural law, are they're called natural precisely because they form part of human nature. They form part of the nature of things. They are the reason for the nature of things. So in principle, they should be accessible to a clear thinking individual. But that precisely was a problem. Since original sin, we had not been clear thinking. And we had been cementing that lack of clarity. It's logical no, that you have, a, you have a piece of machinery equipment or a gadget which is a bit off with a factory defect and you use it, you run it, it will run in a defective way. And running in a defective way, it would inflict more damage to itself. You have to have it fixed. That's why you have factory recalls of defective models of cars. Because if you don't, you just make things worse. And that's what was happening with the human race since the time of Adam and Eve. And the chosen people was not a, were not an exception. So that was the thing, that they were resisting the doctrine. And in order to do that, because of course, <clears throat> men may be flawed, men may be a bit warped, but, but basically we're not stupid. And so do, you had to rationalize that refusal of the doctrine. Here's a man, speaking in very clear terms, purifying the doctrine of the law and the prophets, but I'm not quite ready to accept that. I'm not quite ready to make that radical change in my life. We are okay the way we're practicing the law, the way that the, the scribes and the Pharisees had customized it to our own level of mediocrity. And so how do you put him down? And then the first thing they put him down is, isn't this the carpenter's son? This is the first and only reference to the work of Joseph. Even in the first appearance of St. Joseph, the Annunciation, there was never any mention of what his trade was. He was a just man. That's not a trade. That's his character. That's his personality. So this is the first time. A reference in order to put Jesus down. So in other words, in their mind, they were belittling the craft of Joseph. They were belittling the craft of our Lord. It's like saying, why do they get all this wisdom? Aren't they just carpenters? Aren't they just... Now, a little bit more of the literal sense of that word carpenter. <clears throat> Don't think of a craftsman, a furniture maker, or something elaborate. Remember that Nazareth was a town with 50 families. It was a hovel. It's like going to uh, the poorest part of Baseco. Oh, are you going to find there a real furniture maker? Or, you know, the Greek word for it at that time, koine, is technos. Well, it's not, okay, tecton rather. A tecton is more of a, a laborer. So therefore, who can put his hand into anything? He can be a carpenter, he can be a mason, he can uh, work on stone, even on iron. In other words, whatever you needed, the tecton would do it. As a matter of fact, uh, the scholars have, uh, have said that in order for a man like that to survive with that kind of trade, with that small a town as Nazareth would not have been uh, financially feasible. And the only reason why he could survive was because there was a lot of construction going on in Tiberias, for example, that new town was being built by the Romans. And of course there was a lot of hired hands around the way you see <clears throat> here in the metropolis, you see all these people coming from the provinces, construction workers, that's what a tecton was. And of course, they look down on him. And same thing with our Lord. Forgetting the fact that by identifying them as tectons, they were in fact characterizing them as serious tectons. Otherwise, you wouldn't remember their craft. 
Saint Joseph was the tecton, in the same way that our Lord was the tecton for the town, because they had a reputation for doing their good work. That's still with the literal sense, by the way. But the next objection was the fact that, so therefore, how can a tecton, how can a, a simple tecton come up with such wisdom? And here we go deeper into that literal sense still and go into, uh, start going into the spiritual sense of appreciating a tendency that many people have, which is to refuse anything that goes out of the ordinary just because it's not comfortable for them or even worse, because they didn't think about it. We see that all around. We experience it ourselves. I'm just experiencing it in something um, that I'm trying to organize. People always want to be the Bida. They want to be the star. And if they're not, then they're not going to be very cooperative, hands off. That's a tendency. We all have that. And that's the reason why we can't get our act together in this blessed country of ours. That's the reason why every administration comes up with new things and uh, throws away the previous one. I was always struck by the fact, reading something in National Geographic, I don't know, 20 years ago, because there was a, a, a president, a prime minister, who was inaugurating a dike system that, that was started by another prime minister 40 years before that. So in other words, the person who started that, who broke ground for that, knew very well that he, would not even, he may not even live to see its completion. And it's a good thing that this new prime minister recognized what he had done. You know, this kind of far vision, we don't see that around so much. And there's a reason why it takes so long for, uh, um, there, there are no, a 20 year plan that's unknown in the Philippines. Even a six year plan is perhaps stretching it too much. People always want to get uh, something immediately. Why? Because of their own agenda, personal, plan, political, never for the, hardly for the common good, for the real good of the country. That's the reason for that attitude. And already the Nazarenes were guilty of it. They were too narrow-minded. Lack of that universal outlook, which is really a stymieing of the human spirit. So at the end of the day, these people who think, or people who think that they're affirming themselves, that they're proud, they're megalomania given. Think of a Julius Caesar, think of a Napoleon, think of a Genghis Khan. They were not really that big. On the contrary, they were petty. Because big magnanimity is to think big, to transcend your selfish interests. And self, by the way, is a concentric self. Of course, the most radical self is just you. But then there's your family, and there's your clan, and there's your province, there's your country. It's a good thing if it's your country already, to the exclusion of everyone else. But it's still my, 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 my. Why not ours? Why not God's? Why not God's creation? That's what we mean by the common good. What is good for everyone? What is good considering the nature of everyone? Not of his specific personalities or his specific segments of it. And there's the reason why what is naturally good is really good because it corresponds to the nature of everyone and we all have the same nature. And we have to start thinking this way for the common good because otherwise we'll always be stuck with narrow schemes that may be convenient, but maybe even profitable for certain segments of the population or very small fragments of history, but will never be good in the long run. We need long solutions. 
Anyway, so that was what happened with the resistance to the doctrine of our Lord. But another thing needs clarifying here because they started objecting on the normalcy, the ordinariness of the providence of our Lord. Why, why should he be so special? Why not us? And then they started mentioning his relatives. Are not his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, his brethren, the men, folk, here with us? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all this? In other words, they're locals. We have never heard him to be somebody who studied in Louvain or on the Sorbonne or the equivalent of today, no? Let's say go to Germany and things like that. No, no, no. He has never been in Jerusalem. He had never been schooled in any uh, rabbinic school. He's just one of us. But the thing I wanted to clarify here was, is the common, uh, shall we say, um, argument against the virginity of Our Lady, especially after the birth of Our Lord, by mentioning all these brethren. So therefore, she had more. I mean, there's no less than James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas there as uh, um, Jesus' brethren, so that he has at least four brothers. And then they mentioned there are several names of women also, at least three, so seven. So he must have come from a family of eight. So Our Lady, Maybe a virgin before him, but after that, he, she had those. Well, we had explained this in the past that problem always with people arguing or doing exegesis of sacred scripture in English is because English is just a translation. The first step in reading scripture is to get the literal sense. And when we say literal, not literal according to our scheme, not even according to our culture, but literal Meaning, how did those words mean at that time? What did the sacred writer mean given his particular historical and cultural context? What did he mean by what he said? That's the literal sense. And the word brethren is in English, which in the original Hebrew is more like kin, relative, a, 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 a blood relative. And what is the degree of consanguinity for that? It's spanning from siblings, second degree in the collateral line, not direct line, they're not descendants. And siblings is second degree in the collateral line. Third degree in the collateral line, which means to say uncles and uh, nieces or nephews. And up to the fourth degree of the collateral line, which means to say first cousins. All of those are brethren. Your first cousin, your uncle, your niece, or nephew, or your aunt, all of those are your kin. And that's the reason why John the Baptist was a kin, a brethren of our Lord. So that's the sense of the word brethren. And finally, our Lord would say, a prophet is not accepted, is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. He was quoting scripture because that's really a saying mm -hmm. that no one accepted is accepted by his own relatives because they're so familiar with him precisely and they cannot quite fathom how this, and we have their own experience, how this uh, person who has been drinking with me, playing with me, I even know his, 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 his um, shenanigans when we were young and then now he, he, he's a priest, now he's, uh, he's a bishop or now he's uh, running for public office or something like that, which is again, another limitation to the heart, another limitation to magnanimity, but even another limitation, which is very important, to good, clear thinking, because that's what we call bias. We have to free the mind from such biases. Because only by freeing the intellect from such ignorance in the first place, not knowing anything, or errors, knowing something, but it's wrong clarifying ideas. 
can we really free the heart? Or rather free the will? St. John Paul II, in that magnificent treatise on moral theology, which is very Tati's friend, or coined an expression, which I like very much, because he said, setting freedom free. Because we live in a world where people are so fond of you know, affirming their freedom. They don't want to listen to this. They want to be affected by that. They don't want anybody pontificating because they're free. Realize that freedom is oftentimes enslaved. In the first place, because freedom is blind. It has to be um, enlightened by the intellect. So if there's something wrong with the thinking process, if the thinking process is also shattered by biases, ignorance, or error, then the kind of light that the freedom will receive on where to go, because freedom is the capacity to go, but it's blind. Love is blind and lovers cannot see. You see that expression? It's the intellect that will uh, show it where to go. But if the intellect is also blind, is the blind leading the blind. And that's the first thing they had to do. That's why now uh, with all this um, political exercise of the election, the first step is to be informed. And there's a lot of false news going around. Be informed, go to the fundamentals. And I insist to the social doctrine of the church. What are the real values that have to be, um, what do you call this, protected? To start going from principles and not in a knee-jerk reaction on what's convenient and what's popular, what's comfortable at the moment, because those things would never work in the long run if they are not in agreement with the principles. So that's the, the first thing, to, to enlighten the intellect, to form the intellect. But then there's another set of factors that shackle uh, freedom. And which are the, our passions? Our attachments, it's the heart. We have to train that too, so that they don't um, shackle our freedom. Even if a person is very intelligent and knows what the right thing to do is, if he has vices or he has not developed enough strength of character to do what's right and is affected by what's comfortable, what's pleasurable, or then you'll be like Solomon. Remember Solomon? When he was young, he asked for wisdom and God gave him that to be able to run uh, Israel, the chosen people. But he, he fell into, you know, can you imagine having 700 concubines? You know what kind of a schedule that is, 700 concubines? There are only 365 days in a year. And what kind of people were those concubines? At first, they were people from the surrounding tribes. So the, the number one fear, the number one value that the old law, the old system protected, which was fidelity of doctrine, fidelity of Judaism, was from that very moment compromised because all of those people were coming from different tribes, different religions, different cultural and religious mentalities. And that was the demise of Solomon. From idolatry to ad adultery, or the other way around, from adultery, because th those were all adulterous relationships, of course, to idolatry. The two biggest sins in the Old Testament, which in the New Testament, I mean, to say in the present dispensation, happens to be a big problem too. Perhaps I would even say, the demise of many are erstwhile good leaders and good people. Setting freedom free. And you see what happens? We were reading a very simple incident, but these are the spiritual senses, or this is the spiritual sense underlying that. When you look at the life of our Lord, you bring it to prayer, you contemplate it, and then you realize there's so much lesson to be learned. And that's the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Because I'm trying to teach you a way of praying, which is going with Christ, dialoguing with him, penetrating the gospel scenes, 
falling in love with him. Because when you do that, then you follow him. And by force, you will be identified with him. And you will have learned how to be a child of God. And with that clarity of mind, looking at his life, with that strength of love, wanting to follow him, regardless of how much sacrifice it takes, then you set freedom free. Free to follow the inspirations of the paraclete who had been active in your soul since you were baptized. Free to listen in the first place and free to follow through. And then we will live our lives as God wants. And as that point in the way of St. Jose Maria would say, many great things depend on, forget it, on whether you and I live our lives as God wants. You have about five minutes to formulate your resolutions and end this prayer. Thank mm -hmm. you.